And joining me on the podcast and on video, it's John Mayer, mining analyst and a partner, SB Angel. Howdy, partner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's go straight to the chart of tin. You don't hear that said very often. But uh, there we are. Look at that. Look at that shooting up there. What's going on, John? What's going on with tin? What's, uh, you know, what's the score? There's Well, there are a few issues to do with other tin mines in the world, mainly in Myanmar. Um, we also know the, the Indonesian government's been messing around a bit with... Oh, you said that. I'm always messing around with tin and messing around with the Indian government. In Indonesia, I mean, stop messing around. Stop you're messing around with tin. Well, they, they do, actually. They, you know, they banned the export of tin uh, in January at one stage. Uh, they then sort of reissued permits. And, you know, of course, the market's saying, well, what's going on here? But how, we know the big, Indonesia... Sorry, sorry, Indonesia, so how big a tin you know, producer are they? They are big. They're, they're, I'm not sure they're as, as big as Myanmar, but they are, they've always been. In fact, they, they were much bigger. They dominated the market for many, many years. Um, they are significantly smaller than they were, and they're, they're, their tin industry is in decline. Um, but, it's of course, they... they, they hmm? It's like a tin pot industry now. Well, indeed, indeed. So there's a lot of tin that comes out of Myanmar, but there's, there are problems in the war state of Myanmar. Uh, yeah. where the rebels are, shall we say, kicking back against the, the junta, the, the government of Myanmar. Uh, and the Thai army are busy on the border with, with Thailand and the Chinese army are busy on the border with China. Uh, and there's, I, should, I think there's going to be a bit of an operation over there and it's going to interrupt more, more tin exports because they've been smuggling tin concentrates over the border of Myanmar into China for, some, for many years now. Uh, and I think it's not so easy to smuggle stuff right now. Tin producers. Let's have a look in the, in the world. Biggest tin producers in the world. Uh, China is easy. To, so, oh, well, Chi China produces its own, but they, but they bring in a lot of concentrate exports from Myanmar, which are smuggled over the border. So it's difficult to know exactly whose statistics they show up in. I think that those concentrates show up in the, in the, in the Chinese industry. Oh, okay. um but a lot of it does come out of myanmar yeah okay uh leading tin uh, countries in the world no oh, so i accept all this uh china tops list uh indonesia so they're saying china produces one hundred and twenty-five thousand metric tons a year indonesia produces eighty-four thousand. that's a lot con you know considering how uh, such small it is in china peru bolivia brazil and myanmar but myanmar just they got their eleven thousand metric tons but um there we are tin who knows it? And uh, and so so you 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 know um, Cornish metals they're in tin, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. So I mean they they they're working up a preliminary feasibility study um, on uh, on the the South Property project. Oh, it's bounced we back there, John, isn't it? After all those uh, rumours, after you quashed the rumours of dead cows and sheep in the mine. And uh, any more news on that? Any are there, are there any sheep or cows being found this week or not? No, no, I, I, I've just met with the management. They haven't seen any dead sheep or cows anywhere near the mine. Oh. Uh, there's also somebody spreading rumours saying that all these tin mines connect together and therefore water is draining from one into another. Uh, it doesn't appear to be the case. We can't absolutely say it's not true, but it doesn't appear. There's no evidence to suggest that the South Crofty tin mine is connected to the other tin mines. And the water levels are holding where they are. Management are not reducing the water level at the moment because they just simply don't need to um they're doing a lot of work underground at the moment getting ready for the next phase of of things as in drilling the resource out so that they've got um a better defined resource for financing purposes uh and to know exactly what they're going to do when they start mining this thing again and when they're ready they'll just they'll 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 take the rest of the water out of the mine so they just don't need to do it right now no problem with it. They've got lots of spares for all the pumps. They've got extra pumps lying around ready, ready for the next phase. Lots of capacity in the water treatment plant. So, you know, it's, well, it was a, whoever was selling it. We don't know why they were selling it, but um, clearly overdone. Yeah. So who is this idiot just well, the, uh, spreading rumours about water in there and dead sheep and cows 
What's the point of that? Because you can't short stock. Can you the size? I don't think, well, is it? Can you do that? I don't think you can. Can you? So why is it just someone who's Justin? You know, people you know, people can do all sorts of things, even with small companies these days. If there's if there's even a, a little bit of liquidity, you can trade CFDs. Oh, there's so much trading that goes on in London that is unseen. Hmm. I was talking to a guy from one of the the quant desks at a major bank last night. And it's incredible the amount of trading that that is is not reflected, I think, in the volume figures at the LSE uh, that goes on. Pe people do so many different things with so many stocks. Oh, that will fuel the conspiracy theorists. Because I mean, Thomas, what we're doing here is giving this this this, this I don't know this person who's you know me a troll or whatever it is. Uh, we're giving them some airtime, and you shouldn't do that with trolls. Uh, but uh, you know they're, they're going to spread more rumors now because we're talking about them. But yeah, but that. That thing you're saying there is all kind of you know dark pools, whatever, and that you trade through that people don't know about. That will because it's often you often get when I when it, when someone you know invests. I'm not, I'm not talking about Cornish metal here, but when someone invests in a stock and they haven't done you know due diligence and research, and it goes down. I've often seen people say, "Well, that's the market makers messing around with it." <laughs> well, hang on a sec. You may have made a bad investment, you know, because you find market makers don't mess around with stocks going up pretty much. Uh, you know, it's always it's al always the ones they're losing money on. It's market makers messing around with it. I mean, I don't think market makers have time to mess around with micro cap stocks. They've, they're busy with other stuff, you know. They haven't got time for that. Yeah, you're right. But I mean, if if they're getting a lot of sell orders in something, they'll. Oh, they'd have to push both down, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, what they often do is absorb, absorb absorb that stock and then look for other ways either to offset the risk or or people to buy it. So the market makers are an important part of the market. They are, you know, they they, they oil well, the Well, they wheel. make the market, yeah, yeah. But, but the, do, do I have seen quite a few times, actually, on bad days, and I think this is a, bit, a little bit of manipulation. I don't know if it's true or not. I will see uh, shares very not traded, Hardly micro caps, very little volume, and they're being pushed down on a bad day, like four or five percent or something. And then it'll close the day out and they'll go flat again. I think, well, hang on, you've been holding the price down on that. So maybe I'm part of the conspiracy theory there. But I mean, I do see that and I become a bit cynical, thinking, hang on a sec, there's no volume, you're just moving that price down to get people to sell or something. And then at the end of the trade, you know, this full 30 comes around and it goes back to zero and it's flat. And you think, there's no trade gone through. How does it move back up? How did it move down in the first place? And why does it move back up? So there's a little bit of that, I think. They do, you know, you see on bad days, I, I think it's a way of making, well, that's how they make money, the spread, isn't it? You know, they widen the spreads out and all that stuff. That's how they make money. So I suppose it can be done. Maybe uh, I'm sure there's rules against that, but uh, it's just a market, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, that's the way it works. Who knows? Anyway, um, okay. Uh, any other stocks, John? Let's, uh, anyway, but let's, let's talk about, so tin we covered. Let's, let's cover uh, gold is the story of the, of the day. Look at that. Literally, um, it's up 15% from that breakout period back here, the 20, sort of 2080, 2090. It's now at like, uh, it's just hovering around 2393. That's, uh, that's shooting up, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's gone way beyond anyone would have expected. Uh, mm -hmm. It's being driven out of China. Uh, it's been driven by the Shanghai Futures Exchange or activity on that exchange. Uh, we looked at the volumes this morning. The volumes have gone from 200, 300,000 lots. Uh, we think that's what that is anyway, up to 1.2 million, about nearly 1.2 million. Um, yeah, this, this, this seems to be where it's all happening. I also think I did read that Chinese investors who are pretty disillusioned with Chinese banks, state banks, commercial banks. Property. They can't they can't really invest in property anymore because yeah. they used to I think they used to buy a lot of flats and things like that off plan. The government Well that's the thing, is it? Chinese do invest I mean I mean literally this, you know, when the stock market started going, there was a worry that, you know, people wouldn't take their money out of property because property's always done quite well in China. But now that is not. There's a huge debt bubble in China. And like I said, there's all these zombie sort of, uh, you know, states gone up. Uh, and so, yeah, they are disillusioned with property now. So they're probably looking and think, oh, gold. That's, uh, you know, they don't trust the stock market, maybe gold. So that's, that's where it's going, maybe. Well, the government's told them that property is for living in and not for speculation. And you're a brave man in China if you go against what the government's told you not to do. Yeah. Uh, and yes, of course, the property market's going down. You've got Evergrande being described as the largest fraud ever in history with 
eighty billion dollars worth of or of, of um, revenues that 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 perhaps shouldn't have been booked. That company is now in receivership. They're also they just put another property company into receivership as well. So the Chinese government has got serious. They said, right, you if you guys don't don't pay your bills, particularly if you don't pay uh, repay any of the debt you owe to the Chinese to Chinese state companies, we will put you into liquidation immediately. So they're getting it's it's got very serious. It's got very nasty. Um, and so you you don't nobody wants to invest in Chinese property right now. So. In a situation where you don't trust any of the financial companies, because they've also had other other scandals out there, where do you put your money? And I think gold gold is a a good default. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I, I would say crypto, but crypto is not doing very well. I've seen, I've seen even Bitcoin is coming off a little bit. It's literally, I did look at a chart of that recently. I was saying, if if you look at Bitcoin, and uh, oh, not that one. Uh, if you look at Bitcoin, right, and whenever it's crossed, uh, let's get rid of that one. Sorry, when it's crossed the 50 day moving average and dropped 7%, it's done that twice in the last few years. It, it, and look, look at the times done that literally 47% a drop, 38% drop. The last time it's gone 7% in the next 70 days, that is. In the next 70 days, so I, I looked at that, it's very odd numbers. So if it drops 7% below the 50 day moving average, in the next 70 days, it's dropped previously after a high, this is, it's dropped 48%. And thirty-eight percent, and it's done that now. And you're thinking, okay, so what, what's happening there? So maybe they're not even trusting crypto. They're going with gold. Yeah, the gold, passion gold. So uh, yeah, have you got any gold stocks, John? Uh, not in my own portfolio, but um, yeah, there's a, there's a few that we look look after. Uh, although I, I I bought some Cavango the other week, so um, yeah, I guess that's a gold stock. They're, they're looking to produce gold in uh, Zimbabwe sometime soon. Are they? How far off are they from doing that? I thought they were just that, explorer. That's a good question. Uh, I assume because they're, they're going to produce gold from a tailings project, so those things are normally quite quick. But uh, perhaps okay. it'll be this year. Perhaps it'll be next year. I I don't quite know. Well, I see. Yeah, we did look at that chart. Was it last week? And they just broken up above that. Uh, you know, previous yeah. uh, support there, then resistance. And now it's back above that. So at least we see maybe the low low has gone there. The low has been had. Uh, maybe it'll move sideways, hopefully, but that's good. Uh, you know, so what Blue Jay mining there? What are Blue Jay up to these days? I mean, when I first, um, who was there now? Who's the management of Blue Jay? Yeah, Rob McGillery's back in. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess, right. He was there before, on, wasn't he? When it, didn't he go away and then come back to something else? What did he do? Yeah, he went away. He, he has a, a couple of other business interests. One of those interests is with a company called Flame Energy, which used to be called Greenland Oil and Gas. Remember that Rod McGillery spent a lot of time in Greenland over the years. He's well known. He knows the geology well. He's been involved in a, a number of different things in Greenland over the years. The government know him. I, I think they have good relations there. Uh, and actually, the opportunity in Greenland is is tremendous. I think the government very keen to do something other than fishing to support the economy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, that's amusing to us, but it's pretty serious for them. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're just uh, they're sitting on the table, they're scratching their heads. What else can we do apart from fishing? Could we do something else we can do, surely. Got all these minerals here. I, 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 I think Rod that's McGillery? exactly the conversation they have, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, Rod has advanced a number of projects in Greenland, uh, in fact, very successfully over the years. They reinstated the resource at Dundas. It's very interesting because it's not something you see very often. They put a couple of other people in charge. There was a, a Danish guy um, who was in charge, and he 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 ran another drill program that was a complete a complete mess up, as far as from what I can see. Uh, and they, you know, the findings of that drill program were that looked extremely inaccurate. And so Rod has taken the unusual step to reinstate the former Jork resource on the Dundas project. I think that's the right step um, because I think it was. I think the work was done properly in the first place. I actually think the deposit is much larger and slightly higher grade than 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 is published. Uh, that's because I've had the benefit of going out there and looking at it. Yeah, look at that. Since two thousand eighteen, it's lost ninety eight percent of its value. That's a bit of a travesty, that isn't it? So this is what happens when people lose confidence in a project. Go back to 2018, everybody was excited that Rio Tinto uh, were testing the, the product from, uh, from the Dundas project. 
They had 42,000 tons of material which had been shipped. It was very easy to ship that material over to Canada. Uh, and then Rio Tinto decided not to do it. Um, they, oh. they had a, an issue with the unions in Canada. They settled with the unions. And as part of that settlement, I believe they decided not to go ahead with, with shall we say, acquiring uh, co uh, ilmenite concentrates from Greenland. Now, it doesn't mean that the deposit doesn't have value because there are other companies in the States and in China, I think, who would be very keen to buy this, this, this uh, concentrate material. And there, there is a, an offtake agreement with a Chinese trading house, sorry, a Japanese trading house to buy that. Now, at the moment, I think that project's going to go slow. The company doesn't have the money to really advance the project uh, rapidly. But in the meantime, management is saying, well, we've got a few other things that we can do and probably do them quite cheaply. And the market appears to be pretty hot for, for helium and other industrial gases. So well, the change in strategy. Well, what, so where are they going? The, where are they getting that from, though? Is, it, is that, That's not from Greenland, is it? Or Well, I, we don't know yet. They haven't told us. But what I'm saying is Rod McGeary has been involved with oil and gas projects in Greenland. It's a place he knows, and it's a situation he knows well. So it wouldn't surprise me if if the if the board was to look at perhaps acquiring some either directly from the government, acquiring some some uh, some oil and gas type projects. Uh, I think more, I think more on the helium and industrial gases side of things, uh, or maybe they'll do something. Perhaps they'll go for some M and A. We 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 simply don't know yet. Hmm. Okay. Uh... Yeah, the company is in the process of rationalizing its current Finland portfolio for further cost savings and expects to be able to update the market soon. So uh, what's happening to Disco? You can't get rid of Disco, surely. You can't just leave the Disco. No, well, the Disco project, they're, they're waiting to see whether cobalt metals um, mm. come back and start drilling that. Cobalt are claiming to have a huge discovery in Zambia, so I think they are largely distracted uh, by that. To be honest, that... that what they claim to be a discovery is, um, shall we say, uh, well, it it was already there. Let's let's just put it that way. Uh, <laughs> but they are, but they're having a good time drilling out a lot of copper in Zambia. And as we know, and I, I will have I've talked many times about how bullish I am on Zambian copper. In fact, I was buying shares in something in a Canadian company called BE Metals uh, earlier this week because I I think they have a uh, very good discovery potential. They've, they drilled some holes into a into something recently, and it says to me that there well, there's a better than even chance of a find here. But um, look, these things are always slightly speculative. We never know if anything's an economic discovery till the numbers are done. Um, but shall we say we we got it one, right once or twice in the past? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Hey, listen. And so you you mentioned people came on. You talking about copper. And you're saying the price of uh, what, what, the price of what has gone negative? You said, oh, the the cost of buying treatment and uh, cost of buying comp copper concentrates has gone negative. So it's the treatment and refining charges that are paid by the smelters, as for the first time in my experience, uh, gone negative. And it's it, it's not it's not quite that the smelters are paying you to take the concentrates because actually the smelter will pay you for perhaps 95% of, of the copper in that concentrate. But it's pretty rare for that. Um, it's certainly, it's unprecedented in my experience. And it says to me that there is a shortage of copper concentrate. And if there's a shortage of copper concentrate, that says to me there's quite likely to be a shortage of copper metal going forward. Now, I spoke to somebody this morning who said, well, you've got to remember there's quite a lot of copper metal in warehouses at the moment. Yeah. But... Uh, we know that there are problems in the DR. Well, we we believe there are problems in the DRC in the Congo uh, with some of the mines. There's a, a number of trucks we believe were were stopped in Botswana because they were not, not only were they carrying copper concentrates but uranium. So I've got wow. the feeling that the CIA might have been involved in that. Um, people don't like uranium moving around the world unless it's all being properly documented. Um, we I know that see the, the, the lorries were glowing, were they? The, and the drivers yeah. were glowing. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. But well, well, actually, cop, uh, uranium out of the Congo can be very high, very high grade, and very dangerous. So um, it is something to be careful about. Um, also, with Cobre Panama in the huge copper mine in Panama has been shut down for quite a while now. 
so that's restricted the market. So, yeah, these we think that we think one, two, maybe even three copper smelters in China might have to shut down because they just can't get the material to operate. So um, it's an interesting market, and we we reckon there's going to be a deficit in this market going forwards, and as a result. Many of the many of the more speculative funds have gone long on copper. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's interesting. It's so many moving parts to try and work out how much copper is out there. So, how much? How do you know how much is in in warehouses, for example? Well, what you what you can see is the published numbers on the LME, uh, the Shanghai, and Comex. Hmm. Um, what you can't see is the unofficial warehouses where where. Funds will often store copper, and it's it's more cheaply stored. Also, you get companies that will, shall we say, maybe buy a bit of extra copper and stick it in inventory. And sometimes they have a, a group of guys who might trade around the market there. But in general, inventories are inventory levels are shorter than is where they used to be historically. Uh, and the market doesn't have an awful lot of spare metal to play with in our in our view. And at the same time, remember that electric vehicles, every electric vehicle uses about twice the amount of copper of, a, of, of, of a, an internal combustion engine vehicle. And that means the more, the more electric vehicles produced by China, the more copper they have to use. So I think this is leading a bit of a fight amongst the Chinese smelters to get hold of supplies. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at, look at, look at copper from 2020, the dash for cash crash in March. It was at was it four three eight? What's, what's that? This is in kilograms, yeah. Um, and that, that's uh, that's cents per pound. Okay, oh, a pound, yeah. Now I've got four four point four. So it was a pound pound wise. It was down at two, and then it's, it's literally more than double that now, double and a half uh, since the dash for cash crash, which is madness. It's definitely it's, it's a bit volatile, isn't it? Shoots up like that, consolidates, drops, and why did it drop down there in? in in when was this june why was that there was something with china in, in from june 2nd 2022 just dropped off off, off, cl off cliff it went back from from four and a half to three and now it's picking back up again what was that why, why did that happen there what, what happened I, in that period i, I think much of this is down to the property crisis in china just oh, okay, general yeah. slowdown in the global economy that you know people getting worried and uh, and there was there was just a bit extra copper around at that time. So maybe the Chinese State Reserve Bureau was probably selling into it. There's all sorts of groups that, that play around with the price. So um, yeah, sometimes you just have to stand back and let it happen. Yeah, all these people playing around with metals. What's wrong with them? Uh, marvelous stuff. Anything, anything else, Johnny? Anything else on the global scene worth talking about? Anything worth mentioning? I, th I think we covered it, to be honest. Oh yes, yes, we covered all. <laughs> but I think there is, I, I think, I think there is a general recovery in the small cap mining sector. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a number of these stocks starting to pick up. Uh, well, Cornish Metals was clearly a a strong move. You tend tend to see these strong moves when there is a little bit of a following market. So um, yeah. yeah, it it just feels that the generally the the bad, you know. It feels like all the bad news is out there and people are starting to come back into the market and buy these things again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was listening to a podcast today, I think it's from Bloomberg, saying that the market, you know, is record outflows, 34 months there's been of outflows from funds and everything in the market. And so, of course, that knocks everything. A double, it's a double hit, isn't it? You get private investors, of course, selling stocks in funds. The funds have to sell stocks then pretty much. Uh, but I was reading, who is it? Uh, I was reading someone. No, it was Premier Mighton, actually. I mentioned last week. Premier Mighton, um, that they're saying now the outflow is down to a trickle. So all you need to see is a bit of a rally. Like I said, that's the AIM All Share Index, down 49% for the last seven or 80 days. It's been a brutal bull market, a bear market, absolutely brutal. Uh, like I said, over 600 companies in that. So that's including the, the good performers as well. So, uh, But you see here, we are now off the bottom, and it's rallied nicely You know, from uh, October to uh, where is it, the start of this year. And so when you have a rally like that, you need consolidation. But it's doing that. It's now in a range. It's not revisiting the lows. It's in a range. So it's looking quite good, I think. Uh, it's above a 200-day moving average, which is like it's not done that for a long time. If I get rid of this arrow. Um, but it tried to get above it there, but this time, and it dipped straight back to low. But now it's above it. It's above it. It's above it. So we are forming a nice range, a base, from which to make a further move from, I think. And that move should be higher, I reckon. 
Yes. So um, I'm looking on the bright side, John. Are you? Yeah, generally, we, we are seeing these things lift off the bottom. I mean, the mining sector was suppressed for for longer, but then that's the way it seems to go. It, it, it gets hit quite hard and it takes a little while for it to to pick itself up and recover again. And yeah, there's a the problem is when you get a loss of confidence in the market, it is difficult to turn it around. It takes it mm. it takes a bit of news flow. It takes um it takes a rally because it uh, it's, 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 it's like a tsunami. When you it's 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 self fueling, isn't it? Sell offs, you know, they fuel themselves. Which is like people redeem and sell off. The fund manager have to sell everything, and basically it's sucking all liquidity out. Now, when you get a rally, you know, when you also you get you know, exhaustion. Maybe you need um, a suggestion of interest rates coming down. Maybe that's the the, the the ultimate catalyst. But then, when the market starts coming, you know, rallying. So a lot of private investors, like I said, in, invest in the rearview mirror. You know, it'll it'll rally for like you know, three, four, five, six months before most private investors will have the confidence to put it back in, and that that'll be the next leg up, pretty much. You know, it's already done a rally from the bottom. The next leg up, then they'll talk to other people. Oh, put money in the stock market, and you've already done then. Sort of, you know, uh, maybe maybe you know twenty percent off the lows in the index before actual private investors start getting involved again. You know, so I mean, the clever money, the fast money, the good money's in now, already in. I think ready for the not not fully exposed. But partially exposed, you know, realizing this, the bottom is in, the bottom's gone, you know, and that's where you can make good money from, like I said, the start, the end of, end of 2023 to 2024, that was a cracking rally in AIM, you know, uh, and now it's just consolidating Brit for a bit. So it's gone up, you know, like I said, already the AIM indice has gone up by 14% in that rally. So that was a good move. And now we're just waiting for the second, you know, second wave of uh, investors to come back in. That's all we need. And that'll feel well, it. We're all momentum traders at heart, whether we whether we like it or not. The the thing is to be brave enough to catch catch these stocks while they're at a low level when when they're very unloved. Mm. Nobody wants to know them anymore. But you, what you need to know is you need to have enough knowledge of the underlying stock to know that it's it, that it can create value. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would yeah. always advise you know if you are confident that management can create value, it's the management you should follow. It's always good if there's a if there's a good project within that company, but at the end of the day, it's the management that really make the difference. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, not the company, any company. This can be. I'm looking for a pure play, maybe not you know different jumping around looking at different resources, but a pure play company. You know, micro cap, small cap, um, copper company. Then listed in the UK. What would you say? They don't have to be. You know, not not one of your companies that you you look after. But uh, what's one you looked at that, that that's a good project? Well, uh, well, the Atalaya company, uh, mm. which runs the old Rio Tinto mine in Spain, it, great management. Um, we love the chief executive there. It, it's good team. Always seem to do a good job. Um, no complaints. Very solid bunch of pe people. Uh, also, another good management team, Anglo-Asian Mining. OK, they're waiting for the government of Azerbaijan to uh, to give them a uh, to renew their tailings permit. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll get news on that quite soon because we're, we're hopeful we don't actually know. Um, it's quite hard to predict what the government of Azerbaijan is going to do. But uh, but we do Atalaya's think that... done well, isn't it? Look at that. Atalaya is going from what 122 to 425. That's from 2016. But even the last... Yeah, it's been treading. It's been doing well from September, but well, even what was it, twenty twenty four? It's 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 right nicely. Um, yeah, AAZ. Okay, what about lithium? Well, lithium, we're 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 big fans of uh, Atlantic, Atlantic lithium with yeah. their yeah the project in Ghana. That's been at very low levels. They that was kind of depressed by the situation with Piedmont. Piedmont's just got uh, got their permits for Carolina. Uh, for their smelter there, so I, I, think, look, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, why does she need a permit? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with yeah. her? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, that is permitted, uh, and and at some stage, uh, I would expect Atlantic Lithium to to do better. Management have been shoveling money in time and time again. There's lots of reports of management putting their own cash uh, into the stock. It's always good mm. to see. Yeah. The government of Ghana is extremely supportive. The Ghanaian Sovereign Wealth Fund has put money in uh, a few months back. Um, yeah, I think look, everything to play for here. 
Yeah, yeah, no. When you say expected to do better, you mean the share price, the management are doing all they can, I suppose. They're even pretty mean, exactly. just like you say. But exactly. um, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, look at the, 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 I'm quite liking this, though. It's forming a base. Like, if you look at this, even when that Piedmont thing came out, that, that short report, which is full of nonsense, came out, it dipped down to this level. Have you seen? It pretty much spiked down yeah. to this level. And then it's bounced back up. Then it's dipped down. A couple of times now, it's retested this. And now you've got this nice little base forming at around about 18 pence. So I think some you know positive news catalyst. What's the lithium price doing at the moment? Is that, is that going anywhere? I don't know. Well, it's a good point. I, I talked to a um, lithium specialist in China on a fairly regular basis, uh, and lithium prices are definitely picking up. Uh, in fact, I'm told that lithium carbonate demand in China is picking up, particularly from BYD. BYD produce a well, I think. I think they've now overtaken Tesla as the world's largest electric vehicle manufacturer, or maybe I don't know if that's by, by manufacturing numbers or by sales, but they are very, very big and they are they are shipping in lithium carbonate for their batteries. So that's good news. Lithium carbonate. Oh, okay. Well, it doesn't seem to be moving anyway. Yeah. Well, that's the key, isn't it? When they start sort of. Um, when they so start, Atlantic uh, lithium will produce. Produce spodumene, lithium in spodumene concentrate. Okay. Uh, but of course, when you make car batteries, you either use lithium carbonate as a as a sort of refined product or lithium hydroxide. Uh, it depends on the type of battery you're going to produce. Whether you're producing a, an LFP, uh, which, to be honest, um, BYD are, have been using. They've been making a lot of um, lithium car. Uh, high, um, LFP batteries using which which generally use lithium hydroxide, so it may be that it sounds like BYD are going to produce uh, use more NCM nickel co cobalt manganese batteries because they tend to use more lithium carbonate in that. But um, I'm I'm starting to talk a bit beyond my pay grade. Yeah, yeah. What I've done there is put an alert on lithium price. If it gets, I don't know what the price. This is lithium futures cut on the COMEX there. But um, once it gets about sixteen, I think it's good to go. So uh, it's, it's it's spiked up to close to that fifteen and a half a couple of times. But it's above a fifty-day moving average now. So it's it is forming a bit of a bottom. May take a little bit longer, but once that starts to go, I think of course Atlantic lithium will go with it. Um, so uh, I'll be alerted. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on that, John. So leave it with me. Good, okay? good. Well, I can I can I can replace your Chinese person or the person in China on the phone this all day talking about lithium. Yeah. yeah. So what's what's I don't talk about lithium all day on the phones. How much mileage is in that? <laughs> well, no, there are people who are specifically employed to ring round the guys who are buying and the guys who are selling lithium and try and figure out what the prices are, and that's yeah. that's the price discovery mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Um, and these, well, you know, like, well, that person there, we great dinner party where there's a lithium bore at the table who knows nothing really, and you get that person next. And, and no, hang on, get this. This person talks about lithium all day, <laughs> so uh, they'll they'll show you up. Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, go on. But, no, look, no, at that, look at that. Look at that price of lithium. Look at that. It went from literally from. I don't know what the, the, the metrics are on this, but you know, in 2021, they started recording this price. It was it was where it is now, and then it went to it's a 13. 13 something 13 it went to 83 by may 22 did a double top there in by december 22 and it's come all the way back down very sharply i that kind of things happens again when you get that bigger hype in a, in a, in a commodity price in there it can go up like that again it's very aggressive i think it'll rally strongly do you again soon uh well we are expecting the prices to pick up whether whether we see that kind of rally again is another matter but uh mm. Um, but yeah, so certainly the, we know there's a lot of demand coming through. We know there's big increases in demand from people like, well, the guys who make the batteries for BYD. Uh, I think that's CATL who do that. Um, we know that the battery chemistry is developing, but but it's the it's the lithium ion batteries that are still very dominant. And I'm sure they're going to be dominant for another 10, 20 or maybe even 50 years because lithium is such a light metal. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, it's so extraordinarily light. It's very hard for anything else to replace it because ev everything else is heavier. I mean, there are other there are other metals that can do uh, perhaps a better job than lithium, but they're all so heavy. So why yeah. would you want to change that? Yeah, why change? Uh, marvelous stuff. Cheers, John. Speaking next week. Thank you, Justin.